we're finishing up a very, very busy time of year, aren't we? And it's always fun. Um, how busy, I use fun, I should put it in quotes. It's always fun to try to go shopping this time of year. And I don't like to shop any time of year, but to actually not be able to even get into the parking lot, much less find a parking space, is not my um, idea of fun. Um, I mean, really, does it get any busier than this time of year? And yet there are, t- there are places on the planet and in our world and our country that are busy like that all year round. And can you imagine being in those types of places? Have you ever tried to find a motel uh, in a place that's just uh, in a very important place in a particular holiday or a particular place? And Cody was one of those places, Cody, Wyoming, for the 4th of July. They actually did, I think, four, three or four different parades and the, the place would just, I don't know, it was just too many people for one little town. <laughs> and it was impossible to get a hotel. I mean, think about places who maybe during spring break that's by a beach. And if you try going to one of those places and trying to find a hotel there, you're, you're going to have to get there pretty early. You have to sign up early, right? Or you end up being much farther away than you want to be or in a hotel room that's maybe not as nice as you'd like it to be. Um, You know, I think Washington, D.C. is actually one of those type places, those busy places, the ones that are busy year-round. And a couple years back, our family actually drove to Washington, D.C. Yes, we drove to Washington, D.C. Yes, we are crazy. And it was a long, long trip. Wasn't it, Abby? Long, long trip. You know, and we, we had planned to stay a whole whole week in Washington, D.C. And, you know, being this far away from the east and all that's going on in Washington, D.C., we don't know anything about any of the destinations we're going to. And you're trying to do the best you can. There's no guarantees, no matter how hard you plan for something, right? And Wendy finds this deal online that seems to be too good to be true for this hotel for a whole week. I think it was like 65 bucks a night or something. I mean, it was crazy cheap. And uh, <clears throat> killer deal. Well, when we got there, it was late. We were, every night we got in late because it was a long trip. <laughs> and we got there and it was dark. I remember it being so dark, especially dark that night. I don't know why it was so dark that night. And we pull into this hotel um, and it was a very, very small hotel right? There's still, I mean, you go into cities, especially big cities, there's certain parts of cities you shouldn't go to, certain places you shouldn't go, much less stay, and you don't know where those places are, right? I have another story in that trip that I won't share the tonight, this, this morning, but um, from Indianapolis, that was, that was an interesting. Anyway, so we're at this, this hotel, we're pulling in, and I have to admit to you, it looked sketchy. It really did. Um, we got all of our stuff. We made our way in and got to the room. And the room was outdated, to say the least. I mean, it wasn't terrible. I, I didn't see any rodents or snakes or cockroaches or anything like that. But it was not impressive. And the kids were in full panic. <laughs> I think they all thought we were going to die. We're going to get shot. I think Sydney said that actually out loud. We're going to get shot. They're going to kill us. And, and uh, I don't know, I might have been thinking it as well, but I'm the dad, right? I have to keep my composure, keep everyone calm. It's going to work out maybe. But I have to admit that Wendy and I were thinking, what in the world did we just get our family into? But amazingly, it's amazing what sunlight will do for a situation. The sun came up, and yes, it was still a little, it was still a small, little, outdated hotel, but it was sandwiched in between these two huge, fancy hotels. So we were okay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and a couple blocks away, there was a really nice mall. Another couple blocks the other direction was another really nice mall, and there was a Costco there. And I mean, we couldn't have picked it better. Not that it was super fancy or anything, but, but we were safe right? Um, 
truth be told, I think that, you know, when Jesus was born, it was kind of into that type of situation, wasn't it? I mean, you have Joseph and Mary, they're, they're heading off into a, a, a very interesting situation. They're on the road. They're going into a town that they're probably not super familiar with, and they're, they're trying to find a place to stay, right? And they didn't have the internet. They didn't have phones. They didn't have any way of communicating to find out what would be a good place to stay, right? Their situation. <laughs> I mean, I just can't imagine it, really, showing up into a town, not finding a place to stay, having to go out back <laughs> into a barn or whatever structure it was back there, and my wife is nine months pregnant. I mean, I know we've heard this story many, many times, but think about the situation. This is craziness. Giving birth to a child. <laughs> I mean, even the accommodations they got, and it was nice that they at least got something, but they weren't the best of accommodations, were they? I mean, listen to the story in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. It says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. I mean, we read through this so quickly, don't we? But this is much more serious than what, it, what we're slowing down to, to maybe pay attention to. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Think about that. Isn't that incredible? Now, when they mention Bethlehem in this story, I always think, oh, little town of Bethlehem, right? But it wasn't necessarily a small town. In fact, scholars actually say that in Jesus' time, it was rather thriving. It wasn't Jerusalem. But it was, a, it was a pretty decent-sized town. And they're going to this decent-sized town not finding a place with a pregnant wife, right? Why no rooms? I mean, if it was a decent-sized town, why no rooms? Well, history and scripture tells us that it was Caesar Augustus' fault, right? He had ordered a census to be taken. And, and what was he really after? He was after tax dollars. This was all politics, wasn't it? He just wanted to know how many people he could tax. And this was in the day before email, before slow mail. I mean, there was no mail. You actually had to go show up. Whatever town you're going to, you, whatever place you're supposed to go to, ordered by the government, you can just imagine what kind of troubles that that demand from Caesar <laughs> did for not only the people who lived in those towns, but the towns themselves, think about it. Everyone had to go some other place. So you're taking a city, you're taking the people who live in that city, if they happen to have to go somewhere else, they go somewhere else. And now you have all these visitors coming to town. <laughs> and where are they supposed to stay? I mean, the whole thing's a mess, isn't it? All these people. I mean, there were, must have been lots of people that didn't have rooms, in fact especially in a town like Bethlehem, the, the line of David. And who was this crazy politi politician who, who requested this? Who was he? Who's this Caesar Augustus? Well, he was the great nephew. He was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And he's actually a pretty interesting study if you uh, want to study uh, uh, people from history. He was a born fighter. He really was. I mean, he came into the situation and he fought for everything that he that he had. Um, he obviously uh, was not afraid to use force to get anything that he wanted. And that's what he was about. But amazingly enough, amazingly enough, because of he was so forceful, the Roman Empire was at peace because of him. <laughs> they weren't going to mess with the guy. So everyone did what they were supposed to do. So peace was in the land for, for many, many years because of Caesar Augustus. He also was the first Caesar who took on this title, Augustus. It's interesting, scholars translate this word Augustus as of the gods. So literally, Caesar 
of the gods. And he was really looking for the title that would um, declare him the greatest of all humanity. That's what he was after. Now, when we say of the gods, we're not talking capital G God, creator of God, right? We're talking little g God. There's only one God. But it's interesting that we sometimes, as human beings, we choose to follow other little g gods. We tend to sometimes make other things more important than God. But we should definitely point out that he was a little g God, wasn't he? Not a big g God. There's only one God. And I think this title Augustus went to his head. He thought that he was the ruler of the world. He can demand anything he wants, and he could, actually. (laughs) He did demand anything he wanted, and he got it. So here he is in this story, the Christmas story. He's ordering this registry to take place in Bethlehem because he wanted it to be done this way. (laughs) And so they did it this way. And so Joseph and Mary, they travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied that trip, this trip, this 70-mile trip that he took, that they took. It's pretty interesting to look at. It's not an easy trip, but they had to take it anyway. What's interesting about the Caesar Augustus, though, is that he thought that this registry in Bethlehem was his idea. Little did he know that he was just a pawn. Just a pawn in God's greater scheme, right? How do I know this? The Old Testament talks about the birth of Jesus, not years before, but centuries before. Centuries before. The, the, the Old Testament tells us, that the, tells us that the Messiah was to be born from the line of David and in the city of Bethlehem. So while it would appear that this was all for pol- political reasons, it was all caused by God. God was sending Joseph and Mary to that town at that time because he wanted them to go at that time and that place, right? They were going to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. Basically, God had guaranteed that the Messiah would would be born in Bethlehem and he was coming true on that promise through an evil emperor, right? Can God use even evil emperors to get his way? Micah 5.2 from the Old Testament tells us, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So this is the foretelling of Jesus coming to Bethlehem, right? And it's actually repeated in the New Testament as well in the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, if you turn with me there, we're going to look at the first gospel in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2. Chapter 2 begins the part of the Christmas story where the wise men come from the east. Beginning with verse 1, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Well, I don't know where the Messiah is going to be born. We don't know that. They did know that, right? In Bethlehem, in Judea. They replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will become a ruler who will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So you can see this earlier prophecy now being shared by these chief priests, the teachers of the law. They they knew exactly where the Messiah was to be born. It wasn't because (laughs) Caesar Augustus told them to go there. Joseph and Mary were going there to register for the census, but they were going there because God had planned that from from the beginning. So about 70 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I mean, it wasn't getting in the car and driving for an hour, right? They didn't have cars. They didn't have roads. (laughs) And you can see the terrain up the top 
white flying is Nazareth, and then down at the bottom is Bethlehem. There's mountains all along there. It's interesting. In fact, people still hike this trail. It's called the Trail of Nativity. And you can see the hikers are actually on the right in the middle there. If I was pregnant, and, you know, obviously I've never been pregnant, but I don't think I'd want to be on that trail. <laughs> it wasn't an easy hike. In fact, uh, if you really think about it, you know, most people can walk, you know, a mile at least within 20 minutes. Um, so if you average that out to 70, you're at least 24 hours into the project, right? With a pregnant wife. So who knows how long they would take to get there. They finally get to Bethlehem. They're tuckered out. I would be at least. And then they find out that the inn that they were hoping to stay in has this no vacancy sign out front. Frustrating, right? But actually not so surprising. Because they were probably on that trail with a whole bunch of people going that way. <laughs> There's probably way too many people for the inns that they had. And this was the day before hotels were on every street corner, right? In these major cities. Rooms were hard to come by. But you can just imagine <laughs> how little the innkeeper knew when he says to Mary, sorry, you can't stay here. Not knowing that she was actually holding the Messiah. You think that would have changed things? So Joseph and Mary, they find themselves staying in a manger. A manger. And a barn type structure, right? Cold, damp. Probably smells like animal urine. You know, I, we know these details because we're from a farming community. <laughs> if you didn't grow up on a farm, if you've never been a part of a farm, you know what farms are like. And whenever there's a barn <laughs> or a little cave or whatever, wherever animals are, it's going to be smelly and dirty. Certainly not a place where you would expect the, the Savior of the world to be born, right? After Jesus was born, he's wrapped in, in swaddling cloths. This is not really a blanket. It's not even a towel. It's really fabric that's been just cut into strips, and they've somehow used it to try to keep the baby warm. I mean, it sufficed, obviously, but in our day and age... <laughs> We have these nice, warm, receiving blankets, and they get to cuddle in those next to their mothers. I mean, imagine the Most High God wrapped up in just strips of cloth in a smelly, damp, dark place. It's just amazing. The Savior of the world. Mary gives birth to this son. It was the greatest miracle in the history of the earth. The Son of God, He was being born as a man. The Savior of the world, He was born quietly, or maybe not so quietly, <laughs> He was a baby, um, in a manger, and He's surrounded by farm animals. Farm animals. I know you know this story. I know you've heard it a million times, but, but just capture this thought. This is the Savior of the world. Being born in the worst of places. I mean, we just can't gloss this over, can we? There's just no glamorizing this scene. We've tried. We have all sorts of great pictures of that scene that looks so nice, but it wasn't so nice was it? I mean, call it what it was. Um, imagine a baby, any baby, being born in a cold, damp, stinky barn. It would be horrible. Terrible. <laughs> now think about this. There is no room for him in the end. There is no room for the Savior of the world in the end. And amazingly to me, God didn't say, hey, stop. 
push the pause button. We're not doing this. My son is worth more than this. I mean, isn't it crazy to think about? He didn't say, no, this is too bad. I want something really nice for my son to be born in. I don't want a manger. I mean, he could have said that, couldn't he have? But he didn't. Jesus was going to be born room or no room. Whatever miserable place he might be born in. Why? He had a mission. To save a people. Us. We are that important to him. That he's coming. No matter what. No matter what miserable place he's born in. He was willing to be born in a barn. (laughs) And I'm so thankful for that. Aren't you? This is the kind of God we have. The kind of God that loves us that much. That he would send his son to be born in the most miserable places. And you knew he knew. He was sending them based on a census that was going to be sending all sorts of people that direction, right? The day Christ was born was the most important day in the history of mankind. I mean, without his birth, he, could have, he couldn't have died on the cross for our sins. He couldn't have defeated death. He couldn't have been resurrected. His birth is what allowed all of this to happen. Without Jesus dying for your sins, my sins, we're doomed for eternity. He had to come. He had to be born in order to die. And yet there was still no room for him in the end. I mean, can you imagine? This is the most incredible story, really. He is coming to save all of humanity, and there is no space for him in the whole planet. No place for him with dignity. Incredible. You know, I'm almost positive that, that if there was someone staying in that inn where Jesus wasn't allowed to get in, you know, that if they would have known that it was going to be the Messiah born there, I mean, I'm almost positive that someone would just say, well, yeah, we don't have a lot of space in this room, but yeah, come, join us. You can't go out there with, with the Savior of the world. Come, join us. We'll make room for you. Right? Wouldn't you make room for Jesus? If you'd been there, would you have made room for him? And yet Jesus is here. Have we made room for him? Are we willing to make room for him this year? That's a pretty important question, isn't it? As we start this new year, How much room in your life do you allow for Jesus? And the fact that you're here on a very, very cold morning, (laughs) January 1st, after staying up late in a a building with no water. (laughs) Maybe some of you didn't know that part. (laughs) Um, How much room would you allow Jesus to have in your life? Now, I know how New Year's resolutions work. I've, I've made plenty of New Year's resolutions, and I've, I've failed plenty of New Year's resolutions, right? I know that this time of year, we're making all sorts of commitments to different people, to, to ourselves, maybe even to God. I mean, the types of resolutions that I've made in the past, I want to read my Bible more, I want to pray more, I, I want to spend, you know, um, more time with Him, maybe having a more consistent, quiet time with Him. Maybe being more regular at church services, spending time with my church family, although I, I'm pretty regular at those. Um, you know, spiritual disciplines. I think we get wrapped up in all these activities. And these things are all good, right? I would encourage you to do all of these things that I just mentioned. But I also don't want to sell you short. I think that sometimes our activities, even if they're for God, make us busier. 
And busier doesn't necessarily make more room for Jesus. Catching what I'm saying? More activity, more bus- busyness does not always make for better relationship. You know what I mean? You know, really our focus, when we're focusing on activities and tasks and trying to get them done, um, I think we can sometimes even lose sight of why we're doing them. Instead, I'd like us to talk more about making Jesus the center of our lives, involving him personally in our lives. Not compartmentalizing our relationship with God into activities and making sure those activities get done, but actually spending more time with Jesus. I kind of think about it like a bicycle wheel. The wheel revolves around the center, right? All those spokes kind of keep everything connected to the center of the wheel. And the bike doesn't work really well unless there's a center to that wheel, right? The health of the center of the wheel really dictates how well the wheel's going to work, how well the bicycle's going to work. And the same is true in our relationship with Jesus. When we put Jesus at the center of our lives, our, our lives, they seem to work better. We're designed that way. We, we're designed to keep him at the center of our lives and allow the other parts to fall in place, right? Instead of the other way around. Everything else just seems to work better in life. Now, I know that there will be problems and adversity coming into our lives. That's part of life. But, but when Jesus at the, is at the center of everything that we do, when our lives are including him, when our lives are focused on him, then everything else falls into place. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter, no matter how difficult it might even be, we can even find you know, peace rather than stress because our focus is on Jesus. And he's a part of our life. We can find love rather than hate. We can find patience rather than anger. We can find even contentment rather than greed when our eyes are on Jesus, thinking about him. So uh, in this world of New Year's resolutions, how do we put Jesus at the center of our lives? What are some actual things that we could do to center on him? without making it into so much activity-oriented stuff. Well, I'll give you two things just to consider on your journey. And, in, and it's not an exhaustive list. It's really just to throw it out there to get you thinking. Something that you can do to get you started in the process. And the first one I would mention to you is to pay attention to what God is doing in your life. Don't focus so much on what you're doing, but focus on what God is doing in your life. And in the life of people around you, it's amazing as God's working in my life, if I, if I see <laughs> him surrounding me with people who, who are difficult to love, I'm going to probably assume that I need to work on <laughs> loving people that aren't so easy to love, right? Or, or if I find myself in a situation that requires patience, I'm probably going to have to work on patience, And we can kind of pay attention to what God is at work at in our lives. Notice what he's working on and then join him. Live into that in our world, in our faith. I mean, God's always at work. And our job is to notice what he's doing and and jump in there and help him, right? To be a part of whatever he's, he's a part of. In order to do that, it requires us to pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Not only for an hour a week, right? But you'd actually have to pay attention as you're living your life out beyond these doors during the week. Living into his presence. Listening for his voice. As we live our lives in this manner, we center our lives on Jesus. But it does require us to to take time to quiet our hearts and and listen, right? And that's the second thing I'd offer you. (laughs) Slow down and breathe. Slow down and breathe. How about that for a New Year's resolution? (laughs) We live in a fast-paced world. We live in a busy, 
living one activity to the next. We're jamming as much stuff into our days as possible. Our to-do lists, those things we want to get done, it's just it's never ending, right? There's not enough time to do all that we want to do. And as a result, as a result, we, we tend to leave enough room to not leave enough room in our lives to actually quiet our hearts, to actually listen to God. Spend time with Him. Grow in, in that presence that He has surrounded us with. To, to make space throughout the day for Him. Are we able to see what He's doing in our life? The only way we can see it is by slowing down and breathing. When's the last time we slowed down and breathed? All the rooms were booked when Mary came to give birth to her son. There was no room for Jesus. So let's make sure that we make room for Jesus this year. Can we do that? He's inviting us into an experience so much greater than we can have on our own. We'll just spend time in his presence and grow in that relationship. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I do just thank you. What an amazing story. This Christmas story. That you would send your son into this this terrible situation (laughs) to be born in a barn just because of your love for us. The world at that time just just hadn't made room for your son, made room for Jesus. So Lord, would you help us as we begin this new year? Would you help us to focus our attention on you? Would you help us to make room for Jesus in our life? Would you help us to slow down and breathe And not just be so busy in activity, even if it's activity for you, but to actually spend time growing that relationship with you, spending time in your presence, listening for your voice, responding to you in obedience, including you not only (laughs) for an hour here or an hour there, maybe just doing our devotions in the morning and then rushing off to do the rest of our day, but trying to integrate our lives, our days, to include and remember you throughout the day. Would you help us to do that this year? (laughs) In fact, this week, this day. Would you help us to take this year a day at a time, focusing on you? We just are so thankful that you are a loving, encouraging, compassionate God. And we give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are starting next week. We're going to be starting a new series. It's called Rethinking Church. It's kind of interesting. I think it kind of goes along with what we've been talking about, centering on Jesus. I think at times we we think of the church as, as a place that we go to attend and maybe to give to an offering. But there's just so much more to church than that. It really is meant to be a body of believers, people who come together as a community with one goal in mind. What's that goal? (laughs) Jesus. To grow in our relationship with Jesus. So we're going to spend a few weeks um, looking into Scripture and looking at what what the church is is meant to be about. It's going to be a a fun time, I think. I've got some interesting things that you'll, I'm sure, love because you'll love all my exciting ideas. We do usually take the first month of the year and really focus on the presence of God in our lives. We usually have a throne, if you remember that, if you've been here for that with us, focusing on the presence of God in our service and in our lives. And we're really going to, we're going to do that, but we're going to do that in a little bit different way. We're going to be thinking about how God's presence comes into our lives through each other, that he's working through you to help me and and vice versa. So we'll be getting into that um, this next week. But I do want to close our service this morning 
drawing back into this thought that Jesus was, was willing to be born in a barn and die on a cross for us and, and just thinking about how important we are to him. So you think about this as, as you're leaving this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 18 from the message. It says that God didn't put angels in charge of this business of salvation that we're dealing with. It says in Scripture, what is man and woman that you bother with them? Why take a second look their way? Talking about us. You made them not quite as high as angels, bright with Eden's dawn light. Then you put them in charge of your entire handcrafted world. When God put them in charge of everything, nothing was ex- ex- excluded. But we don't see it yet. We don't see everything under human jurisdiction. What do we see? We see Jesus. Jesus made not quite as high as angels. And then through the experience of death, crowned so much higher than any angel with the glory bright with Eden's dawn light. In that death, by God's grace, he fully experienced death in every person's place. It's us. Verse 10, it's, it says, It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer, Jesus, perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Since the one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin, Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family, saying, I'll tell my good friends, my brothers and sisters, all I know about you. I'll join them in worship and praise to you. Again, he puts himself in the same family circle when he says, even I live by placing my trust in God. And yet again, I'm here with the children God gave me. It's talking about us. And since the children, us, are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death, and he freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for who? It was for people like us like us children of Abraham that's why he had to enter into every detail of human life then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins he would have already experienced it all himself all the pain all the testing and would be able to help where help was needed that's Jesus he's wanting to be a part of our lives he's holds us in so high esteem. And he's experienced everything, all the pain, so that he can be there to help us. Don't we want to include him in our lives? Would you stand with me as we close this morning in prayer? Lord God, I do just thank you for these people and thank you that they are willing participants in a journey with you. They desire in this next year to to live for you, Lord. Would you help them to see just how how much you care about them? And as we leave this place, how much you care about everyone we encounter. I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, that you would allow us to be your hands and feet. That you would allow us to be your light to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. You are sent.